um, this evening. We're going to jump into <coughs> the father of metaphysics, that he's sometimes called Parmenides. In order to proceed, all right, we want to know what it is to be rational and what it means to accept reason. Uh, just as a sideline, um, some years ago I wrote a play about this very uh, material, Parmenides, and it was filmed at uh, Golden West College, and it's available on audio uh, videotapes. It's a very fine production. A lot of people came together and did it, and. Uh, kind of in honor and respect of the people who put so much creativity to it. I'd like to consider tonight's talk in honor of those people who devoted so much great talent to the production of that film. So, What's yeah. Called? What's the film called? Uh, being the One. Yeah, 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 yeah. It does have a title. Yeah, Being the One. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. Comma. Now, there is, so much, there is so much that's interesting about Parmenides because Descartes, there's a whole bunch of modern thinkers. Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and now in the modern world, there's some other modern thinkers now who are taking this thing that's called rational, purely rational, and they're now exploring it. Uh, in the same list should be Bradley, by the way. <coughs> and uh, he's quite an interesting figure. We should do some talk about Bradley one day. But in any case, the normal way of considering Parmenides is to consider that he is devising a structure of thought, purely rational. And therefore, he is making statements about conceivable structures. That's the way they talk about it. And the foremost thinkers that explore this conceivable structures, the logical structures, the conceivable structures, are these thinkers. And then, of course, the logical positivists uh, came along and criticized it severely, but now it's back in vogue through quantum physics. But it's this that I want to challenge this evening. None of this is true. None of these people are in the tradition of Parmenides. He doesn't deal with conceivable structures. He is not, therefore, a realist in the philosophical sense. That's where we're going. So let's try it. All right. Now, what am I going to invite you to do? I'm going to invite you tonight to be rational in a different way, I suspect, than you're prepared. So let us play. First, <clears throat> while you admire the art, I would like to know whether we could agree that we can make some statements about this seed. All right, it grows this way, grows this way, grows goes through all of these stages, doesn't it? So we can say, uh, we can say, this is the whole development of the seed. Or we could say it's the whole development of the plant, and we could talk about it either way. But the thing I'd like to take a few moments on is this rather curious and strange question. And <laughs> look, here. no doubt we will get no disagreement when we say there is a present before us. Safe, we can proceed. By the way, where does it come from? Does it come out of the past? Or does it come out of the future? <laughs> look here. Take another look. It's happening right now. <clears throat> right? I mean, everybody knows the present. 
Where did it come from? Well, use these three terms. Uh, sir, we need your help. Well, look here. What if the present came out of the past? Well, then it would already be tired, would it not? Heavy with age. Right? Weary. And therefore, that would be the weary school. But if it comes with vitality and freshness, could it have come out of the present? But wait a minute, if it wasn't at one time, the time when it wasn't, what was it? Future? I think the present always is. So I agree with you. Argument. I agree with you. Would you agree there is things, however, that go through changes? And all we're wondering now, <clears throat> yes, in this moment of the present, right, would you not agree there is some content to it? That is, something happens in the present, does it not? Ah, good, 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 good. We can even picture it this way, can't we? Now, Miss, where would you say it comes from? The past or the future? Well, I don't know. Well, if it comes out of the past, remember the way we were reasoning a moment ago? It would already have been. And therefore, it would just reappear in the present once again. Or would you say, no, there's something peculiar about the moment. It doesn't look like it's been around before. Can you take a look and let us know? That's good. I often do that myself. <laughs> hmm. uh, can we be safe at this moment in saying it can't come out of the past? And if it did come out of the present, it must have been somewhere before it came in the present. That must have been the future. So therefore, would you agree time travels in this direction? And we can picture it perhaps something like this. Right? This is something yet to be. Right? And then it comes in, part of it comes into existence, agree? Part is yet to be. And then it fully forms itself and is in its present. And equally well, when it passes out of existence, right, into the past, part goes first, part is left over until finally. It is all gestuntgen. <laughs> and therefore, in that same way, it takes the same form, doesn't it? <clears throat> Would you agree, sir? You know, maybe I need to get my watch fixed. Why is that? It seems to go the other way. Wait a minute. In what way does it go the other way? Does it come out of the past? Well, I guess the potential time is always in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Aristotle's version, by the way, of time. Yeah, that's very specific. Yes, 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 yes. The only trouble with that is that's really a measure. Uh, anything that measures motion is not time, but a measure of motion. But we'll leave that be. All right. Now look here. Now that since you are so good at this, I wondered whether you'll go the next step for me and say, what direction does this go? Present, right? Present, right? It goes this way, doesn't it? Well, look here, what do we have here? This event, this is, becomes the past, this becomes the past, this becomes the past, this becomes the past, that becomes the past, does it not, successively? But yet, through that, through, wait a minute, it's going this way though, isn't it? No, no, no. The development is going this way. It's just going in the past. Okay, we've got that. Okay. The development, curiously enough, like any process in evolution, is going forward. But time is going in the other direction, is it not? <clears throat> now, we're just guided by our reflections. And in order to help your reflections a bit more, uh, if you'd pass some of these back, these are, these are the fragments of Parmenides. Now, <clears throat> I would just like to stay with one fragment. 
And that is called fragment number six. All right? Now, that's called the problem. So, let's take a look at six. Yes, please. Pass these back. Now, would you agree, as we look at this, hold it before you read it for a moment, okay, just for a moment. Would you agree, we have to use two sets of terms now, to be, not to be. All right, that's what we want to do. We want to use these two sets of terms. Would you agree, the future is not, Right? Is not. Right. Uh, to be is here. So to be is caught between two not to be's. So wouldn't you agree the simplest statement to make about anything, therefore, in time is it both is and is not? That is, it's a mixture of to be and not to be, and two ends. From this very simple diagram, which I worked long and arduous, arduously on. So now let's read together. <clears throat> it is necessary to say and to think, say, to think, that being is. For to be is possible, and not to be is impossible. I bid you consider this, and I warn you against another path along which mortals wander ignorantly, with divided minds and scattered thoughts, so befuddled and helpless as to resemble the deaf and blind. There are crowds of them without discernment, maintaining that to be and not to be are the same and not the same, and that everything is in a state of movement and counter-movement. Everything is in a state of movement and counter-movement. Well, then, whatever we say is, is equally to be or not to be. Now, look here. <clears throat> Everything depends upon this one paragraph. What does it mean to say that to, not to be and not to be are the same? Look here. It's the same in one sense, right? And in another sense, it's not the same. Uh, is that correct, sir? Yeah, it is what it's uh, does it fit our diagram? Yeah. In one sense, to be and not to be. Another sense, is, it's the same, right? To be and not to be is the same. In another sense, it's not the same. And there's a counter-movement. There's a movement and a counter-movement. What does he tell us? Avoid this path. Avoid this path. Come then, listen to my word. Take heed of it. I will tell you of the two roads of inquiry which offer themselves to the mind. I'm in quote number five. The one way that it is and cannot not be, right? What is cannot not be, right? It cannot not be. So if we're dealing with anything that is, that can become not 
We know one thing. That ain't his. That's not being. There isn't any more fundamental notion in philosophy that is misunderstood than this notion. You can line up a whole history of philosophers and you can just judge them in terms of this one or two paragraphs and see where they fall. Take a look at five and take a look. Is that what he's saying? What is cannot not be. This is saying what is can in fact not be. And one time it wasn't and now is. And not. therefore we know one thing about it. In so far as whatever that does, it is not what is or being. Right? That has nothing to do with what is. Therefore, you see, this is not a conceivable structure of thought. The Leibniz, Spinoza take it as, there are many possible worlds. If the worlds are possible, then they must be. As many universes as there can be, that's the number of universes they are. If they are logically consistent, therefore they can be. Therefore he takes to be, or what is, to be of, a, of an idea that does not and cannot be expressed within these diagrams in our understanding of paragraph 5 and 6. That's what we're going to push now, 5 and 6. Watch. Come, listen to my word and take heed of it. I will tell you of two roads of inquiry which offer themselves to the mind. The one way that it is and cannot not be. It's the way of credibility based on truth. The other way, that it is not and that not being must be, can't be grasped by the mind. For you cannot know not being and cannot express it. <clears throat> well, there remains, therefore, but one word to describe being. Paragraph 7. Only one word by which to express the true road is. That's it. Now, watch the language. Right? He uses the word path many times in this work. Path, road. <clears throat> now along this road, there are many signs. There are a whole bunch of signs on this road. Watch the way he describes it then. There remains then but one word by which to express the true road is. And on this road there are many signs that what is has no beginning, never will be destroyed, see, never will be destroyed, never will be destroyed. It's whole, still, without end. The Greek word, by the way, is perfect. It neither was nor will be. It simply is. Now, altogether, one, continuous. But there's only one word you need to know. Right? Is. Now, there are many signs along that road where you can put other, other names on it. But it all has to come back to this one word, is. How could you go about investigating its birth? How and whence could it have grown? I shall not allow you to say or think that it is as coming from not being. 
where it's impossible to say or to think that not being is. Besides, what could have stirred up activity so that it should arise from not being later rather than earlier? Necessarily, therefore, it simply is, or simply is not. And strong conviction will not let us think that anything springs from being except itself. Now, how did he get to this? How did he get to this? Look at the way he talks about it in 2 and 3. These are all quotes that come from, presumably, a dialogue with the goddess he has, a talk with the goddess. Look at the way it goes. Never shall it be proven that not being is. From that path of inquiry, restrain your mind. Don't let custom born of everyday experience tempt your eyes to be aimless, your ear and tongue to be echoes. Let reason be your judge when you consider this much disputed question. The heart, when left to itself, misses the road. Gaze steadfastly at things which, though far away, are yet present to the mind. For you can't cut off being from being, does not scatter itself into the universe and then reunify. Now, let's see now if we can see how he pulls together dramatic elements in the journey and see whether we can see in that interesting patterns that complement his thought. So, <clears throat> Let me suggest a structure, and we'll read it and see whether you follow it. All right? They are essentially, uh, in this work, uh, according to the way our translator has it, two primary paragraphs with three divisions. This is called the journey. It has two parts. And then when he reaches it and encounters the goddess, there's a preliminary dialogue that takes place here before then we get into some of the material we just read. Now, as you examine the first paragraph, I'd like you to be aware of several things. Number one. Throughout the entire journey, there are different kinds of beings that play a role in it, but they are all feminine. Right? They're all feminine, every one of them. So therefore, as it opens up, the steeds that draw my chariot, it's not steeds, it's feminine, it's mares. Through the entire thing, therefore, there's a dominant female role playing through the entire journey. So keep that in mind. Second, <clears throat> see how many words carry in any way, directly or indirectly, the idea of intelligence. Motion. Then, as he then proceeds into the second paragraph, again, watch the way in which the ideas of intelligence and all the forms it may take, and rest. Then, notice there comes a transition point, and both motion and rest are left behind, and then the goddess comes in. So, let's just go over the first sentence alone and tell me how many images you would say can be related to the idea of intelligence, right? right. The mares that draw my chariot, motion. What are they? The mares are doing the, the drawing. We're conducting me to the furthest most reach of my desire. See it? furthest most reach of my desire. 
bringing me at length to the resounding road of the goddess along which he who knows is born through all cities. That's an interesting road, isn't it? Right? Well traveled. Along which he who knows is born through all cities. There's a route. So as you look at that, would you go along with me and say, well, the steeds obviously then must have some intelligence. They're conducting me. There's motion, drawing my chariot, right? There's a reach, a stretching forward of desire, bringing me at length onto the resounding road of the goddess along which he who knows is born through all cities. So if you would just take a number, tell me, how many images of intelligence and motion do you find in the first sentence? They're there, aren't they? See them all? Watch that now. Second sentence. Along this road, I was carried. Yes, the wise horses drew me in my chariot while maidens led the way. Intelligence again, leading the way, right? Not only that, we can say something, can we not, about the horses, they're wise, right? They're drawing along their way, good. Now notice where the energy is focused because we need to see that now because it's going to repeat itself twice. Right? Visualize it, visualize it, right? The axle urged round and round by the by the whirling wheels on either side, glowed in the sockets and gave forth a singing hum. Hear it? Right? There they go. See that? Motion and action. The handmaidens of the sun, who had left the realms of night and had thrown back their veils from their faces, were driving the chariot speedily towards the light. See all the action? What is it? Plenty of images of intelligence and motion and motion moving towards the light, isn't it? Right? A lot of feminine images throughout the entire thing brought together into a nice unity. Watch the shift. We came to the gates of day and night which are fitted between a lentil above and a stone threshold below. Although the gates are of ethereal substance, they have the strength of mighty doors when closed, and retributive justice secures them with bolts that both punish and reward. But the maidens conjoled her with gentle words and soon managed to persuade her to pull back the bolts from the gates when the gates were flung back on their hinges, which were nailed to bronze posts on either side, a wide expanse was revealed through the open doorway. It showed a broad avenue along which the maiden steered my horses and chariot. Right. Now, going back. Right. Still, evidences of intelligence? Furtherly, further developed, more intelligence at work than earlier? Did it move from motion to rest? All of the images of solidity and firmness and stone, is that there? Motion and rest, right? Now, a Greek listening to this, you and I, let's be Greeks. Some beautiful quotes in here come from the Iliad and the Odyssey. They come right out of it, and someone familiar with it could easily spot it. And therefore, a listener would say, what is going on? He is a philosopher. He's creating a story of a spiritual journey. He's writing it in the style that combines both Hesiod and Homer. Is he in... Is he in is he, by the very form of his literature, what he's creating to express his ideas, is he putting himself on the same level or going beyond them? 
In any case, he's using the same kind of style, isn't he? Very careful use of language and metaphors, isn't he? In a very, very interesting way as he combines them through these only two paragraphs. Yeah. So look, now we stop. Now in comes the goddess. The goddess greeted me kindly, and taking my hand in hers, she spoke these words. Welcome, my son, you who come to our abode with immortal charioteers at the reins. Uh, it's no evil fate that has sent you on this road, but right and justice have brought you here, far away from the beaten paths of men. Now watch her conclusion. Three things emerge. It is needful that you learn of all matters, both the unshaken heart of well-rounded truth, one, and the opinions of mortals which lack true belief, two, for it is needful that by passing everything under review, you should learn this also how to judge of mere seeming. Three goals, agree? One, two, three. Now, it's not fate that's brought him here, therefore this whole journey has a precondition, it's ethical, right? Right and justice have brought him along and therefore, we're on the side of a curious kind of ethics or the virtues must be present, right? Arates, right? Justice and right. Ah, now, oh, look here. Look what she does with that. It's no evil fate that has sent you on the road, but right and justice have brought you here. Therefore, these are the preconditions for the entire journey. That's what brought him here. So therefore, when he returns, <coughs> he has three categories, to, and we have to look for them. Well-rounded truth the opinions of mortals which lack true belief. Would you agree? We found a couple of opinions, beliefs of mortals which lack. This whole idea, therefore, is condemned as being irrational. Notice what he's going to call rational now. He's saying, <laughs> that, that this is what this is all, this is, this is the nature of reality. Now you can talk about it in a set of terms. Continuous, altogether, one. That's what's real. That's what's real. She's urging us then to think in these terms and reject all other terms. And if you do that, then you are rational. It is necessary to say and to think that being is. Let reason be your judge when you consider this much disputed question. Restrain your mind. Don't let custom born of everyday experience tempt your eyes and your tongue to be merely echoes. Well then, what do we need to follow reason? Well, the very nature of reality, therefore, never came into existence, will never depart. It is now. Altogether, ah, by the way, I, sh I, I didn't put that in. I like that word so much. All right. It is now. All right. That's it. Now. 
That's reality. Is, it's continuous, altogether, one, complete. Now he's going to add to it several more ideas, and they are very interesting. And therefore, if I could get your <clears throat> attention, I'd like you to move into what is called uh, Section 7C. Now, as we go through it, I'm going to highlight a few words and we can pull it together and add to what we have. It is immovable, held so in mighty bonds, and it's without beginning and end, because both creation and destruction have been driven away by true belief. Remaining always the same and in the same place by itself, it stays fixed where it is, for strong necessity holds it in the bonds of limit, which constrain it at all sides. Here's the line. Natural law forbids that being should be other than perfectly complete. <clears throat> All right. This is something that is perfectly complete. See, if it is perfectly complete, then nothing can be added to it or taken away from it or it would lose its perfection. That's what is. That's the nature of reality. It's perfectly complete. It needs nothing. It's total. It's total what? Perfection. It stands in need of nothing, for it needed anything. Anything at all, it would need everything. I'm going to skip a sentence and come back to it later. And I'm now moving to paragraph E. Since there has to be limit, being is complete on every side. It's complete. Its completion is its perfection. Now watch the way he plays with it. I'm going to stay with one word and don't lose it. It's a simile. <clears throat> like. like the mass of a well-rounded sphere. He's not saying it is a well-rounded sphere. It's like a well-rounded sphere, equally balanced in every direction from the center. Clearly, it cannot be greater in any direction than any other, inasmuch as there is no not being to prevent it from reaching and reaching out equally. Nor is it the nature of being to be more here and less there. The all is inviolable. Since it is equal to itself in all directions, therefore it's homogeneous, no differences, no differences in the nature of reality, right? It's homogeneous throughout. No limit. Its only limit is perfection. Now, what is this kind of thinking? Right, let's stop for a moment. Now, right, we're engaged in this kind of reflection, aren't we? Right. We're engaged in this kind of reflection. We're trying to keep our minds on this and not veer from it. That's our goal. We want to focus on it and see if we can explore it. And so we're keeping our thought consistent with us. And that's all we're considering. 
say, wait a minute, then that kind of thinking, then that kind of thinking, it's the same as the nature of reality. I mean, if you're thinking these, and this is the way the nature of reality is, then you're thinking the same categories that the nature of reality can be, can be considered in. Is that right? Oh, well, then thinking and the object of thought at this point are the same. Is that right? Does that follow? Then thinking and the object of thought are the same. Hmm. We have a conclusion we can now reach. Section D, thinking and the object of thought are the same. Next step, thought and being are the same. If you are thinking in these categories, I mean, if this is where your thought has brought you, then whatever we mean by thought, if it's able to hold this together, Right. Well then, this is being, and this is thinking. Why? Look here. <laughs> ah, look here. Thinking and the object of the sort are the same, then thinking and being are the same. What kind of thinking? This kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Now that's called the way of truth. Here I bring to close my trustworthy, rational discourse concerning truth. What does he call it? A rational discourse. What does he call it? Truth. This is what he regards as true. Learn next about the opinions of men. As you listen to the deceptive ordering of my words, there's something I'm going to say that's deceptive and you have to catch it. For men have established the habit of naming two thought forms. That's where they made a mistake. Therein they have erred. Because one of the forms ought not to be named. One of them shouldn't have been named. Now we're going to push it. Examples. They have distinguished the thought forms as opposed in character and as having properties which set them apart from each other. On the one hand, there's the fire of the upper sky, gentle, rarefied, and everywhere identical with itself. On the other hand, lies opposed to it, utter darkness, dense, heavy. I shall tell you about this uh, supposed arrangement as men understand it, in order that your knowledge of such matters may not be inferior to theirs. Right? I'm going to tell you about it the way they understand it, so you'll be able to understand it as well as they do, and therefore your understanding will not be inferior to theirs. But you know what? That's all deceptive. Now, um, we can do something, you see. He is going to have a set of opposites. He's going to set up a set of opposites and they're going to be opposed one to the other. But then, in every case, he's going to bring in something that unites them together. If there's something that unites them together, then they can't be utterly opposed to one another. They may function as opposites, but it is not true then that they are primordially or basically or intrinsically in the very nature of reality opposed to one another. They're just two different forces operating that fit into a higher unity. Let's see if that's there or not.
you shall come to know the nature of the sky, one, and the signs of the sky, two, and the unseen works of the pure, bright torch of the sun, and how they came into being, cosmology. You shall learn the nature of the round-faced moon and its wandering works. You shall know the encompassing empyrean, the encompassing empyrean, whence it arose and how necessity grasped and chained it so as to fix the limits of the stars. The empyrean encloses it. The same thing is going to be true in the next one. Watch. You shall learn how earth and sun and moon, one set, and the sky that's common, what embraces it. How the Milky Way and outermost Olympus and all the burning power of the stars arose. Two, something inclusive. Now, this idea of, a, of the cosmos he is going to place within the cosmos divinity. So in these opposites, he's still going to place in anything, right? He's going to place a divinity within it that's going to play, just like as we talked about with Heraclitus, a major role. The smaller orbits I are filled with unmixed fire. Those next to them are filled with darkness, although an allotted measure of light accompanies them. In their mist is the divinity who steers everything. She it is who rules over love unions, painful births everywhere, prompting female to join with male and male with female. Right? So right in the midst of all generation is said to be the divinity that therefore is responsible for all procreation, all coming into existence. When women and men mix the seeds of love together, the power that results from the mingling of different bloods, if it preserve harmony, fashions a well-formed body. But if there's hostility between the seeds that intermingle, so they do not produce a unity in the newly formed body and the growing embryo will be badly disturbed by the conflict of the seeds. So, what are the three categories? False beliefs, we know them. What are these? These are the beliefs of man which he is going to be introduced so he will be able to judge of mere seeming. And this is what we now have in review. So they are three categories, not two. We've covered them, and that's what I like about Parmenides. Now, in your work, you also have a page from Aristotle. Remember, each night we're going to go back and give Aristotle a grade. Here we have 14 quotes, no, less than that. Nine quotes from Papa Aristotle. Let's give him a grade. There is only one first principle in the universe and it's changeless. All right. All, right. All these thinkers set up as first principle, some pair of opposites, despite the fact that they declare the all to be unchanging. 
For even Parmenides sets up hot and cold as first principles, calling them fire and water. Whereas Milesius speaks of the whole as unlimited, Parmenides offers a more acceptable view in declaring that the whole is limited and extends equally in every direction from the center. Do you say that's what it is or that's what it's like? Parmenides seems to have conceived of reality as one by definition, whereas Milesius conceived of it as one materially. Therefore, the former takes it as limited, the latter as unlimited. On the ground that not being is contrasted with being, it's nothing at all. Parmenides is forced to conclude that being is one and there is nothing else. But again, like the others, he posits two basic principles, hot and cold, or he calls them fire and earth, and these he puts, and of these he puts the hot on the side of being and the cold on the side of not being. None of those who have affirmed that the all is a unity have grasped clearly the meaning of that kind of causal explanation, except perhaps Parmenides. And he is, uh, so far as he virtue, uh, pardon me, except perhaps Parmenides, and he, insofar as he virtually postulates not a single cause, but two. That which is other than being is not. Hence, by Parmenides' argument, it must follow that all things are being, and hence one. When dealing with apparent coming to be, Parmenides describes the being and not being which it involves as fire and earth. Certain earlier thinkers maintain that what is must necessarily be one and immovable. They argue that since the void does not exist, what is cannot be moved, and that there cannot be a plurality of things because there's no void to keep them apart. Okay, we have seven. All right, judge them for me. What grade? As you look at it, would you say from what we've done here that he's represented the essence of Parmenides? Of what he has represented, are there things there that you didn't notice that aren't there? Yeah. Where's the hot yeah, yeah, yeah. That was going to be my question. Did we miss one? Well, he does have... Um, um, he, he has uh, number 13, the smaller orbits are filled with unmixed fire and those next to it, darkness. So he has... But whether those, it looks like those are... first principles. They could call the first principle that appears to be things in the universe that are fire, mm -hmm. rather than principles. Yeah. Okay. So that's, an addition. that's an addition. Yeah. Aren't these supposed to be the opinions of formalists, not necessarily yes. the truth? That's right. Okay. That is another difficulty. Okay. Okay then. By hands. All right. What will you do for number six? Is he right on? Raise your hand. Oh, she's on that, isn't it? I think so. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Number seven. No. No? No? All right. Well, it's interesting how he says in the number six that they say that there's only one first principle, and then in number seven he says that Parmenides sets up hot and cold as Well, he just principles. forgot he said that. <laughs> All right, eight. All right, Parmenides offers a more acceptable view in declaring that the whole is limited and extends equally in every direction from the center. He says the whole is perfect and extends like it's... Yeah. 
Yeah, when you like. focus on the word like, then that's intended as a simile and not literally. All right, nine. But then there's the line that says, for strong necessity holds it in bonds of limits. That's true. I mean, I, yes, continue it though. Huh? Con you have to finish it. Okay. Um, which constrain it on all sides. Now here comes the reasoning. Natural law forbids that being should be other than perfectly complete. Therefore, it's the fact that it's perfectly complete that accounts for its limit. Would you not agree if you're listening to a very fine sonata, you can't arbitrarily go in and change one note? And same too with a Rembrandt painting, even though I have tried. No, I haven't. Ten. On the ground that not being is contrasted with being, is nothing at all, Parmenides is forced to conclude that being is one. He posits two basic principles, hot and cold, calls them fire and earth. With these he puts the hot on the side of being and the cold on the side of not being. He didn't do that. He's looking at some other fragment that we don't have. <laughs> well, that might be a conclusion. That might be a conclusion. None of those who have, assume, have, a, have affirmed that the all is unity have grasped the, clearly the meaning of the kind of causal explanation except Par Parmenides. So what does he consider? The all is what? All is a unity. Does he say the all is a unity? All means many things together. Does he say that anywhere? He excludes that, doesn't he, very clearly. Right. Single cause. He, insofar as he virtually postulates, not a single cause, but two. That's right. Okay, 12. Does he say that all things are being? Does he say that all things are being? Or does he exclude the whole idea of things? All right. 14. that covers many people besides um, Parmenides, and it may be inferred that he's talking about Parmenides. So, let's, yeah, right. so what grade would you say, Guts? As you add up the points, there should be 14 units for each one. What grade would you give them? D. D would be gracious. Let's give him a D. Go to D minus. D, ooh, D minus. <laughs> now look here. Suppose we now open up a whole bunch of books in philosophy about the ancients, and suppose we find that there's certain things that Parmenides is saying that are not included, but suppose they bring to their views of Parmenides the very views of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Then what would you conclude? that Aristotle is their primary source for a certain class of judgments. Because even if, even, uh, let us even assume, which is most likely, that since no one has ever found a complete work of Parmenides, we don't know what the whole is. All of these are called fragments because they existed in other people's writings and they have just separated them from the context and put them all together and called a collection Parmenides is fragments, that's a, that's a whole body of work. So surely there may be a lot of things that are missing. And it may even be that he's correct about some of those things. But if that's the only source for them, Aristotle, then for other people, good heavens, would you not agree? Uh, he either must find correspondence with what other people are saying at the time about Parmenides, or he has some private source. Well. Thank goodness we have other quotes that go on, and we can't do it now, but you will do it at home, right? And go through it and see whether other Greeks agreed with him, and we can then give him a grade, can't we? 
And that's the way we are playing the game. So, before we go into Milesius, or Milesus, any questions about our good friend Parmenides, who started this whole game going? Have two comments. I'm being very naive tonight, maybe. What he's talking about reminds me of two things. One is the mystical experience is exactly, yeah. mm -hmm. which to me is very irrational. That's why we were uh, talking. What? What? It's very irrational. I, no, no, that's rational. I'm, I'm saying, but mystical. I'm joking. Yes, is, I agree. Okay, and the other thing which it reminds me, which is extremely rational, yeah. is. Not quantum mechanics, but Einstein's theory of relativity and uh, uh, space-time continuum, which is this whole thing of everything is within the one unity of the four-dimensional space-time. You might be right, but I think you may be thinking of uh, Whitehead. Are you not? Uh, Undifferentiated? No, I, I, I mean, nor, uh, uh, Alfred actually, North Whitehead. No, it, it, right. it was... Uh, Undifferentiated continuum? No, it's um, people relate to Einstein, but it came even before Einstein. But normally, if you will look at okay. general relativity and special relativity, okay. well, you have the whole continuum. Um, See, but if it is a continuum, would it take on these qualities? Yes, it, it is. Now, it is, the, it is the whole totality. It's the, no, the idea no differences. No differences. The oh. past, the oh, present. Well, then. It's the whole thing is the, the future is already. I mean, this is another way to talk about the... Um, no, here, no... no. I, I understand, but what we mean, yes. the original diagram yes. that we have, where well, we have past, present, and future, okay. and that is mm -hmm. all simultaneous in the reality, which is the same as this. Well, we should get a couple of good articles on it and have a continuation to see if we can put the two of them together and we'll look forward to your article mm -hmm. right if you can cut it out and uh, yeah, yeah, good. Good. yeah it's important mm -hmm. please um, <clears throat> going back to thinking as being yes it seems that as we explore these models we create a reality about them and I had a teacher who once said the minute you find a particular <coughs> go hunt up its polar opposite and play in that for a while, and then play in all these other ones, and that real wisdom comes from moving between the models and not mm -hmm. staying in, in any one particular model. Because no, no. if thinking is being, it's, it's almost as though we create this reality as we think about it with its own mm -hmm. beingness, you might say. And uh, I mean, it, it's fascinating. It's no. like, it's, I don't know, it's like pulling creation out of the void as we as we look at it. We could go into another room across the world and meet with a group of natives and they would have some other incredible construct. Uh, undoubtedly. What's interesting about this though is that this is very, if we take a look at this and stay within its terms, then the vision and the symposium of beauty itself matches everything here. And the vision and the Parmenides, uh, pardon me, in the symposium, according to the Jawa translation, is that vision which is open only to the mind, the mind only. In that sense, it's rational in the same sense. And what one grasps here is the nature of reality. And uh, there may be other models, of course. The only question we have is whether or not they are open to the same kind of verification through one's experience. And that's the game of comparative philosophy. Right? In other words, what we'd like to do is call upon the people in those different traditions that have different models and say, we would appreciate it if you would point out the people who are preeminent in your field, who have in some way in their own personal experience confirmed us. Then they have to mar march forward, and they then have to hear their statements and see how they match it. And then we have to see whether or not we can find any way to understand them comparatively or whether or not they fit into a hierarchy. That's the way we would do it. Because at this point, this is for us, <coughs> in hearing it, what you may regard, let us call it uh, 
uh, an opinion, right? It's an opinion or it's a belief, but the author is crediting it for a right opinion, right? And in this game then, to discover the condition for it being right, the condition for it being right is you then have to have a set of reasons you must discover the reasons why it is called right. And when you have that, that's called understanding. And when you confirm that in your own personal experience, then that's called knowledge. So we would then ask whoever has alternate models, thank you for your model. Let us even assume it is right. Now, would you please give us your reasonings and your reflections that therefore we can use to understand why you call it right? And would you tell us what class of experience you have had that you can see that every statement you have made through your understanding can be confirmed in the experience? And that would be a way then of matching them on that level of verifiability. Then we would then see to what degree they, they match it or whether we can arrange them hierarchically or whatever we do. Another, please. Um, I was talking to some philosophers last night, sort of struggling with this idea that you know, reality can be totally. That reality can be. That the truth can totally be found via thought. And, and what they said is that they said that the, the philosophers distill all of the uh, emotion and feeling out of their heart and develop a big head. So, uh, so that's mm -hmm. true, right? It's actually true. I, even when you drew the picture, it's, it's a big head. Yeah. Yeah. So it really is. It, it really, it really is. Yeah. I can change it though. Watch. I can make it into a big heart. <laughs> I was moving from the image of a fat head to a to a full heart. You see. Yeah. Um, see. Um, Yes, um, there are people who call this inflation, right? When the ego gets involved in this, it's inflated. And um, that's true. That's why to stay on the level of opinion, even if it's a right opinion, or to stay on the level of understanding is to miss the goal. The goal is really to see whether or not you can confirm it in experience. And it's likely if it can be confirmed in experience, the person may have less ahead than he had before it when he only understood it. Right? That's, uh, we hope. Right? I'm sorry, say that again. person who might have uh, missed that last part. Missed the last part. Well, the kinds of experience we're talking about are so profound that that restructures the whole psyche and invariably brings a person to see the humanness in, in everything, or the, the value in things. And, uh, at least that's, that's what is reported to do. And hopefully. Do we know, do you have a clue, who is the goddess, which goddess is, does he mean? No name. We don't know. No, I, I know, but you, no, you don't, no, what do well, you think yourself? There are, two, there are two goddesses. One is the one that's telling him the story, and the other that guides all love unions. So it may be Aphrodite. Like yeah, it sounds like I'm for time. <clears throat> and uh, all right, I would like just to deal with just one curious thing now. Three simple sentences. All right, just three simple sentences. We have nothing else to do. We have three simple sentences. Now, what I'd like you to do is when you hear the sentences, is to hold them in a different way. We are used to reasoning in a certain way. Uh, the style of reasoning that we're going to encounter is much often easier for us when we go this way. Reverse, the, reverse it. So I'll read it the way it is, and then we'll explore it going backwards. Anything that ever was must always have been and will always be. 
Same thing, see? Anything that ever was must always have been and always will be. Reasoning. For if it had come into being, then before its coming to be, it must have been nothing. But if there ever was nothing, it would have been impossible out of nothing for anything to arise. So now we'll read it backwards. Would you agree with the last statement then? If, if ever there was nothing, pure nothing, it would have been impossible out of nothing for anything to arise. For it wouldn't be pure nothing if there was something that could arise from it. So if there ever was nothing, <laughs> still be nothing. Now, if it had come into being, then before it coming to be, it must have been nothing. No, that's that wonderful thing that uh, St. Augustine relates, you know, when someone asked him, you know, uh, what was God doing uh, before creation, three weeks before creation? And he told the child, well, he was building a hell for guys like you who asked that question. <laughs> now, you may not find that in St. Augustine's works, but I have it from very good authorities that it's somewhere there. <clears throat> All right. Therefore, it must follow, must it not, that anything that ever was must always have been and will always be. This is what they are calling, this is what they are calling <laughs> rational. And to accept reason in this structure, that's what it is to be rational. Therefore, would you agree, it's in, it's in an interesting contrast with common sense. It jars completely, totally. See, we have the notion that common sense, that's the bedrock. We can rely upon it. Right? And the more our language matches common sense, and the more we can have statements that can be confirmed in our everyday experience, then we can have a class of statements which can be verified in everyday experience, to which all men, to which all men, common, see, common, to which all men can agree. That package is rational. That's what it is to be rational. That's not this, is it? This is not this. Totally different. Therefore, their use of the word reason is different. What they mean by rational is totally different. Isn't there a problem here, though? Isn't there a problem here, though? Because if, if, you, if you gain knowledge and you, were, and you had the reasons for it, say you were the only person who could understand the reasons, how would anyone else know that? Well, you just know it yourself, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. This is not something. See, in this system, any number of people can, conform, can, can, uh, can confirm it for you. In this system, only you can confirm it. That's right. How about a third system, which is just as against the common sense, mm -hmm. and that is the scientific rationality. I mean, they're begging, by being too idealistic, <coughs> they're begging the question because they talk about time before defining time. Hence, they say if um, the sentence begs, it's, if time did not exist once, then the whole issue of what existed before the nothing becomes linguistically... Yeah, sure. Of course. That's right. The whole problem is time. Absolutely correct. That's right. But if time came to Absolutely be right. the way that we believe in modern scientific mythology, it did. Oh, well, look, look.
Would you be willing to say that when we talk about time, we mean that three-part division? Ah, move it over there, please. What? Time? If we say time had a beginning and an end. And if time itself had a beginning and has an end. Right. Mm -hmm. Then what is, is between those two points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it is the great big unknown, and yeah. it's stupid yeah. to even ask questions about. Yeah. Would you agree, however, if we look at this? Right. See, um, the past, what do we want to say? Do we want to say it is or is not? It is. The past is? It continues to be? Yeah. I mean, someplace this pen is still marking on this board? Yeah. In some <coughs> place, by place meaning... In some place, right, would you agree then, there is some place in our theoretical universe where what I have already marked is yet to be, and, and where I am going in this discussion is already completed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Then then you have you don't have these three divisions. You have a present that includes I mean a past that includes the present and includes the future, don't you? Well then you don't have three divisions of time. Because equally well by the same logic you'd have to do the same thing mm -hmm. right across the board. Right? Yeah, you get to his right, is. I have no problem with primarily and the big is. It was the, it's when you got to these three sentences and the idea came, nothing can arise, I mean, something cannot arise from nothing. If there ever were a nothing, a pure nothing, could anything come out of it? Yes. What? Yeah. I mean, what? there's nothing logically which... If something could come out of it, then it wasn't pure nothing. Well, if nothing then if, nothing, if nothing, nothing, I agree with you entirely. If nothing comes out of nothing, there'll be enough room for it. <laughs> here, try another one. Look here. Suppose we were interested in saying the same way we spoke a moment ago, that there is necessary to find some way to verify whatever it is we're talking about. Shall we use that as a hypothesis for a moment? Well, suppose someone came along to us and said, this idea of time you have is very interesting. But I've never met anyone who uh, visited the past and came to tell us. Uh, is it possible to confirm there is a past? Is it possible to confirm that there is a future? Uh, how can you confirm that it's there? Yeah. Would you be looking at the past or would you be looking at moving images on a screen? Thank you. Those are moving images of the past. Uh-uh. It wasn't of the past. What is it? The past it's a present. It's, it's a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look here. Is there any way to confirm that there really is a past? Future? Therefore, the whole idea of time is a fiction. It's an inference. Not only that, we can even go further and say, strictly speaking, all you have is the instant. All right. Because what is must be that which is not capable of being separated in terms of past and future. Right. Like if you were to say, oh no, the present is one second in duration. You can say, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, if you don't mind. Uh, one half of it is <laughs> yet to come and one half of it has been <laughs> around. Therefore, how much is there just for the now? You would say, one-tenth of a second. <laughs> one-twelfth of a second. 
someone would come along and say, excuse me, is it not measurable that you can say 1 24th is on either side of it? So how much, how much uh, time is there in the instant of the present? It can't be measurable. It can't be measured by time. Therefore, the present is not in time if it can't be measured by time. And so such paradoxes emerge when we treat it with the kind of so, rigor so, so that I we... Can, so if I can time that fall on the present... Pardon? If I can time something, then I've fallen out of the present. Is that right? You fall out of the present? <laughs> If you fall out of the present, would you let me know where you fall? I'll watch. No, no. What, what, what do you mean? You want to try it? I don't know. I'm trying to get the word like that. Yeah. Oh, it's not easy. Oh no, it's very difficult. So if you were present, there wouldn't be any time. Is that what the conclusion is? Well, you can't measure it. Because if you could measure it, it would be divisible. And if it's divisible, it wouldn't be the instant. Now, strictly speaking, this is the most beautiful of all Plato's uh, hypotheses. This is called the third hypothesis, third hypothesis in the Parmenides. In Zen and things like that, we use the word being present. Oh. And the point is that uh, subjectively, when you are present, Time appears to march along much, much slower, whereas where you're watching it, time whizzes by. So there is something about if when you are in the present, like time ceases. Yeah, yeah, watch. Would you not agree that anything you experience, whatever it is, right, takes a measurable time to gain an impression of it as a light wave strike the retina etc right. that means does it not that there is always a difference between the moment of the experience and when you record it and experience it within yourself therefore all experience is of the past and no one has ever experienced the present and they don't know what the present is because there's always a time lapse mustn't there like, for you to understand what I just said, when you understand it, it's already time removed from the time when I uttered it. So if you're following me, right, you're grabbing things that I've said and putting them together in a nice package, but where is it? <laughs> right? But the important thing, though, isn't it, if we stay strictly with this, that no one has ever experienced the present as the present, so long as this is true. Therefore, from sense experience, there is no way to confirm there is a present. <laughs> right? By definition, if it takes some time to, right? So everybody is talking about get into the moment, and you say, well, I'll see if there's enough time for you to get in there, but you know, you're. <clears throat> Right? Yes. Yes. Right after you. <laughs> Another model on time is uh, frequent past, present, and future. You shift gears and say time is change. You observe something changing, so time equals change. And if you carry that mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the field of hypnosis, mm -hmm. what some therapists do is they bring people in to a state where they create a lot of change and a lot of history in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. relatively, the person comes out and it's as though they have lived these changes and so forth and therefore have kind of an inbred history uh, because they've given them so much experience it's in a short period of clock time, mm -hmm. it's time is change. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another example of just switching models again. If we forgot about the past, present, and future, and just let the time has changed, and then picked another model about time, and another model about time, in the long run, I think what we pick up is a kind of wisdom, because we can start comparing these models. Yes, yes. Uh, what do you think would happen if we could get a description of what Parmenides calls is, <clears throat> everything that we said about it 
And then suppose we could go a step further, right, and get in that description all of those terms that are akin to it so that we have a very interesting full picture of the, of the is. Now, what would happen, do you think, if we were then to put someone under a hypnotic trance and read them a description of this and tell them they are going to experience it when they come out of hypnosis, then they would be able to confirm whether that experience is in fact possible, and then they would be able to tell us, would they not, about the nature of what is. I think you have uh, enlightenment for 2595. I was present, we had an experiment once, some years ago, where we took this very thing and we added to it Plato's symposium, the vision of the nature of reality, what is. And some chap went into it, and we brought a hypnotist, of course, who brought the person into it, and read it to him in all the splendid detail. Mm -hmm. And he was under, and he was experiencing it under hypnosis, and he was really ecstatic. And then, of course, the hypnotist said, now, look here, you're going to for, you know, you're going to forget everything, you're going to wake up, and you're going to feel great. But in, uh, when it's 10 o'clock, uh, you'll see when, the, when it's exactly 10 o'clock that you're going to come out of it and you're going to live through the experience again. Only this time, fully awake. And so he came out of it and he said, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> he said, when are we going to do this experiment? And everyone's going, ha, 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 ha. <clears throat> And he got quite agitated for after a few minutes, and he said, he kept looking at the clock. He said, you know, he said, um, I thought it was at least 10 o'clock. Bing! <laughs> and he went through the whole thing. What? He went through the whole thing. And um, I, I don't know whether I would advise it, because there's a whole question of integration and what you have to have and what you have to do and whether or not uh, hypnosis is, is, is equivalent to LSD and whether there are any differences and whether either should be used. There's a whole bunch of theoretical questions that are important to ask. But what was most interesting about this evening was the fact that I turned to the hypnotist and I said, look here, there's a whole group of people in this room. And there were, the whole place was full. Big room. And I said, why don't you just now take the whole group and do a group hypnosis and let everybody go into it, whammo and we'll have a good time this evening. Well, he got before the group, and I mean, this chap was, the blood must have drained out of him. He turned fearful, he turned afraid, in a few seconds. And it looked like he was going to faint. and he ran outside and he threw up everything he had formerly eaten. And he would have nothing to do with it, and he gave up hypnosis after that. So sometime later, to tell you the story, I had a chance to have a cup with him, a cup of coffee. And he said at that moment, to possess that kind of power was something that he had never, ever anticipated. And therefore, it, it shook him right down to the foundations, and he couldn't act it out. Yeah, the responsibility, group responsibility was overwhelming to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my ignorance in asking him to do it. Um, could the gentleman or the person who experienced the hypnotic state, could he put words on what he experienced? Oh, Was he able to describe it? Oh, indeed. At the 10 o'clock when, when oh, he yes. had the waking experience? No, no. No, no. He had the experience, and when he came out, he used that vocabulary precisely and talked about it and went into even more language, all consistent with the first set of terms. Used many more terms okay. than we originally had given him. Are you claiming that by reading the symposium that it will activate the mind to go to some his state? Or his, his, his mind was activated to go to his, his state? I can just tell you the story. You can, I think there are several possibilities and they're all worth looking at. And I think that's a couple of them. See, I've basically experienced this myself on the LSD. And that's yeah. why, you know, sure. however, I mean, to me, that is one vision Mm -hmm. of reality because yes. I have experienced other visions of yeah. other models of reality. I mean, yeah. I'm not denying that model yeah. as being valid. That yeah. model is yeah. fully valid since I've experienced it, but mm -hmm. also there's other coexistent models which are also fully valid, if that makes sense. Only if they jive with that one, though, right? 
right? Because um, you is did one experience way of, that. That's one way of, yes, that is one experience which doesn't, I mean, there's a part of you yeah. which is always in that. You mm. cannot get away from isness. Sure. Could I ask you a couple questions? One is, um, if they are these possible ones, and one of them is this one, right? Say there are four possible ones, and you have to make a choice now, which one would you go towards? Well, that's definitely why? the best thing I would expect. Why, why, why? 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 Because aesthetics, but, but it, it is. Aesthetics. Aesthetics. Aesthetic. Both, no, I, I'm saying aesthetics, just not. Aesthetics. Aesthetic. Yeah, it's more beautiful. Ah, mm. more real? That, does that beauty have any reality to it? Or is it just pictures? Well, you know, it, the it, smile it, on the on the Cheshire cat. What? It, it is more real. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Feels more real. Yeah, 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 yeah. Vi vital vitality to it, as well, or dead. Um, I'll, I'll use the word vitality. I did. Uh, I never considered. In that well, term, but yeah, if you put it. yeah, vivacious in that sense, alive, yeah, living, yeah, living, yeah. living, yeah, living, 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 living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even Stupid. If, uh, if, stupid? No, but uh, even wait a minute, wait a totally wait. mindful. Vitality at the same time is totally still. I mean, it's oh yes, vitality yes. At the same time, is yeah, being yeah, static. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Any boundaries? Hmm. No, no. Uh, no limits. Uh, could you use the word perfect? Ah, oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Perfectly complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so therefore. You need an argument. You have to, we have to come together and find an argument that would say, yes, while well, there are other models that are experiential or possible to be experienced, uh, this stands out as unique among them all because it shares all of these terms in such a high level, uh, perhaps most perfectly, and therefore it is the most perfect vision. That's what we have to find an argument for that. But that's However, where... you couldn't go along 24 hours a day living no, no, in reality. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, it's a very you, no, no, reality no, no, at the same no. You time. may for 24, but we'd be pushing at it at 48. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it burns you at the yeah. same time as oh, yeah. it's being wonderful. Wait, wait. I, I have a friend of mine who uh, was into Zen and bumped into one of these experiences, and so the Zen Roshi said to him, um, what makes you think it's real? <laughs> I said, I don't have to think. So, Roger said, well, any differences? He said, no differences. And Roger said, well, could you have a hamburger? He said, nope. Roger said, why? The kid said, if I was eating a hamburger, I would keep on eating all the way to my elbows because I wouldn't know any differences. <laughs> so that, that's your point. Right, that's a Zen story for those of you. It's very famous in Huntington Beach, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Is that that guy silver there with that? Want to know whether it's <laughs> want to know whether it's true? That's another problem. <laughs> no, but it, it, a variation of that did in fact happen with someone I know. So the last paragraph I read from you, read to you, was from Eliseus. Yes, hold it. Yes. <clears throat> oh no, I didn't have questions. Oh, I thought you had your hand. Right? I did. Ah, good. Well then. Just one final. Sure, question. sure. When we were talking before and you were laying out the model with um, the knowledge and understanding and so forth, mm -hmm. you were standing in that model and with that filter or that screen judging other models. Mm -hmm. You could not not do that unless we were somehow to take and wipe your mind completely clean and then bring you over to China and give you a totally different mind. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And you were saying that that That's model true. is exquisite, is, um, I'm trying to find the words, it is perhaps a truthful model. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one judge of truth is that if we looked at a lot of other models, mm -hmm. the things that showed up common mm -hmm sort of the template that was mm -hmm. underneath a mm -hmm. lot of the differences mm -hmm. would kind of be the truth. It mm -hmm. reminds me of the mm -hmm. saying that truth is like a hard ball. You can kick it around all day and it will be the same at the end of the day. Yeah. That these bits of these other models that yeah. 
that have reflections and ultimately show up again and again, almost like a Venn diagram, like the old lapping parts yeah, or something, yeah. that that's the truth. That no matter where you stand, you're going to find yeah. some kind of an interconnection. Yeah. If there are a series of models or experiences, and you can find something that runs through them all, then that thing that runs through them all must be more primitive, primitive in the higher sense, uh, than any of these, that's correct, then the whole goal would be, is there a culture that allows you to gain an insight into that, perhaps verify its existence? Right? Yeah, that's the game. Yeah. So, let me do one more or two sentences on Melissa's so I can get the flavor of it all to you. Well then, since what is real could not have come into being, it not only now is, but always was, always will be, and since it has neither beginning nor end, it is unlimited. <clears throat> so we find the same thing in Parmenides, Melissa's, um, Heraclitus, remember we found the same thing in Heraclitus, the same higher vision. And therefore, just to remind you, right, those great quotes of um, listening not to me but to the Logos, it is wise to acknowledge all things are one. Wisdom is one to know the intelligence by which all things are, stir, are steered through all things. Same thing as Parmenides. And we can find other quotes to remind you of what we did with Heraclitus. Therefore, you know what? These curious people were pursuing a certain line of thought that went on and on. And the richness came from what we now call Turkey, what comes also from what we now call Syria. It came then from Greece. It came out of perhaps the Minonian culture in Egypt. It was that rich, lively culture that brought together this very interesting and high development of human thought. So, thank you very much. Well, questions? Um, just one thing I, I wanted mm -hmm. to be greedy here and ask you to uh, tie Zeno into Oh, Zeno. Oh, well, Zeno takes the opposite side of it. He says, if you don't think this is true, I'll show you what you think is absurd. If you don't think this is true, if you don't think this is true I'll show you that what you think is absurd. So would you say he, he comes away with the same principle as Parmenides or something different? Oh, no. He shows that the common notions that you hold to be true, he'll show you that when you look upon them, two possibilities emerge, and those two possibilities are irreconcilable, yet they must be assumed to be true. Therefore, the everyday worldview is held to be contradictory and absurd. Let's try it. All right. If things are many, they must either be finite or number or infinite. Agree? They must either be finite in number or they're going to be infinite. Okay. Well, take the case that they're going to be finite. For they must be as many as they are. If finite, they must be as many as they are, neither more nor less. And if they are as many as they are, that means they are finite in number, are they not? Hey, wait a minute. On the other hand, if things are many, they must be infinite. Because you'll always find uh, other things between any that exist. And between these, there are always yet others, are they not? Well, therefore, things must be infinite. That's the way he reasons, see. Oh, you think there's some legitimacy in your view about things? Well, they either must be infinite or finite. Good heavens. Really? One or the other? Oh, well, he can show they must be both. Both, yet they're contradictory? Yes. What does that do to the original theory? 
looks like it shows it to be irrational. And he does that again in several other ways. All right. Anything must be moving. He used the argument with motion, which is another one we're all familiar with. All right. Good. 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 My pleasure. Enjoy it. Thank you.